Good morning, Hope Community Church. Um, welcome to Hope on our um, streaming today on Zoom. Um, I wanted to start off this morning um, with a scripture and kind of the theme of this morning when I was going through um, songs this week, I just felt like just kept hearing the words, be still, be still. And so as we enter into worship this morning, I just want you um, just to give you the um, permission just to be still and to be quiet before God this morning. Um, some of you love to sing out loud and some of you just need the permission to sit and listen to the words that are being sung. So um, let me read the scripture to you. And as I read, just may you still your heart before the Lord this morning. This is um, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God will help her, when the morning dawns, the nations rage and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes the war cease to the ends of the earth and he breaks the bows and shatters the spears. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still. Be still. Oh, can you church be still and know that he is God? I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth, says the Lord. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I know this week was a hard week for me to just sit and be still. As my mind wandered and my heart ached for our country, it was hard for me to just sit and think of you and just be silent. Father, I just pray as we worship this morning, as we come before your throne, that you would teach us how to quiet our hearts, quiet our minds. Teach us how to worship you in the midst of pain. This is the time to worship you, to praise you, to proclaim your name, that your name is above every other name. Father, we just thank you that you are our rock and our fortress, that we look to you in this ever-present time. God, we thank you for your goodness. In your name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
raise, here I raise my devil Caesar, never by thy help I fall, and I hope by thy good pleasure, save me to arrive at home. Jesus,
Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are our vision. And no matter in the midst of scary turmoil, tor 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 <laughs> I can't say the word. Um, God, I just thank you that you are in control and that you are our sovereign king. We thank you for your goodness. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I uh, hope you can see and hear me. Uh, Morgan, thank you for leading us uh, just to be still before God. Uh, amidst everything going on in our world right now, there is so many people talking and not enough listening. And I think first and foremost, we need to listen to God and hear from him. So thank you, Morgan, for leading us in that posture of worship this morning. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Harold right now. He's going to do our scripture reading and our prayer. So give us a moment as we transition the, the video to Harold. Good morning. We're reading this morning from Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11 and going through to the end of the chapter. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. May God bless us as we read his word. Let's pray. Lord, we come this morning as a grateful people, grateful to you for your grace and mercy to us, grateful that you have made us one body in you through the cross of Jesus Christ. You are such a great good and gracious Father. And we acknowledge that and come before you with gratefulness. Lord, there are many in our church here that are, are hurting right now. And we ask for their healing. As I look at this prayer request list here, almost everyone on that list needs healing, Lord. We pray that you would touch their lives. We pray that these people would 
trust you, trust you for your healing touch, trust you for your encouragement, trust you for, um, for strength to continue through while waiting for healing, whether that healing be here on earth or in heaven with you. There are also others that are hurting today, today Lord, because of all the, the violence and upheaval going on in our country. We pray that your spirit of peace would pass over this country and calm down all the, the raw nerves that are out there. Uh, we pray that you would turn the violence uh, so that people would start to seek you and would come to you humbly and bow their knees and declare you as Lord and King of the universe and would turn from their ways. We pray for those who are proud that they are not part of all the uprising. We pray, Lord, that you would heal their hearts too. Help them to be humble. Help them to be humble before you. For us here at Hope Community Church, Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to understand what's going on and that you would give us words that we might bring Christ into the picture. Christ the Redeemer of all situations, be it pride, anger, bitterness, hatred, or anything else. Help us, Lord, to be your light, to be your life in this dark world. That you might be praised, that you might be lifted up, and that your glory might shine through all the earth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Harold, for doing the scripture reading and leading us in prayer. We realized that there was an issue with the video at first. We couldn't see Harold, but I think we corrected it. Thankful to Yvonne for catching that for us. Um, I also want to acknowledge today, I talked with Barb Clark um, the, the last couple of days. Uh, today is the anniversary of her daughter, Carrie. Uh, 25 years ago, she was killed in an accident by a, a drunk driver. And uh, Barb and her family today, after the live stream, they're going to go to the graveside and just do a time of just remembering Carrie's life and grieving together as a family and praying. Uh, Carrie was only 25 years old uh, when the accident happened, so she would be 50 years old now. And so I just want to rally us as a church to pray for Barb and her family today. And so I want to just lead us now in a, another prayer uh, for Barb and her family and just for the sermon as we dive in. So, so pray with me. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And God, today, even though it was 25 years ago, we grieve the loss of Carrie's life. At a, such a young age, her life was taken from her. And there is still pain. And there is still sorrow. And there is still sadness, God. So we ask today, God, that you would be near to Barb and her entire family. You promise to be close to the brokenhearted. You promise to save those who are crushed in spirit. So God, I pray today you would pour out your compassion and your love and your nearness upon this family and help them to be able to celebrate and to honor Carrie's life today. And God, as we've already prayed already, it is a heavy time in our nation, and in our world. And God, we feel the heaviness. We can't ignore it. And God, the message this morning is heavy. Uh, and God, I'm just asking, I've been praying all week, God, that you would help us not to be defensive, help us to be open, help us to have soft and tender 
hearts this morning. And that we would hear your word and we would receive it. And we would respond to you, God. And God, I just, I avail myself to you. I ask for your Holy Spirit's power, not only for the words to say, but for your heart as I say it, God. And we want to honor you, God, in everything. And so I pray this morning would honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a story about two brothers, and I'm guessing it was a small town. And uh, these two brothers were twins, and they were inseparable from birth. They did everything together. And um, as they grew up, they eventually took over the family business. It was a store in town, and they were the envy of the entire town because they worked so well together. Uh, one day they were in the store and one of the brothers made a sale to a customer and uh, the sale for, was for one dollar and so i'm guessing it was back in the day when a dollar was worth a lot more than it is today and since no one else was in the store the brother put the one dollar on top of the cash register and a little bit later he went to the cash register to collect the one dollar bill and it was missing and, and so he went to his twin brother and asked him, you know, what happened to the $1 bill? And the twin brother said, I, I have no idea what happened to it. Well, the brother that made the sale, he, he couldn't let it go. And a little bit later, he went back to his brother, accused him of taking the $1 bill. And, and that moment created a rift in their relationship. And eventually, they divided the store into two stores. And they lived in competition and enmity towards one another for 20 years. And 20 years later, a man entered one of the stores. And the man was just very humble. And he told the one brother, you know, 20 years ago, I was really struggling. I was drifting from town to town. And I never stolen in my life, but I was desperate. And I came into the store and took a dollar bill off the cash register. And I just want to come back today to make things right. And the brother that heard this man's confession, he just broke down in tears, weeping. He told the man, you need to come next door and tell my brother what you just told me. He went next door. He told the other brother his confession, and the other brother just broke down in tears, 20 years of enmity, 20 years of bitterness and conflict for $1, $1, how tragic. We are in this series called Ain't Worth It. And last week we talked about worry, how worry is a waste and a cheat. We talked about inviting God to break the stronghold of worry in our lives. And my prayer and hope this past week is that you experience freedom in the battle against worry, that God is doing a work in you uh, through his spirit. And this morning, we're going to address unresolved anger in our relationships. And there are many forms of unresolved anger, but I'm going to use the word bitterness to encapsulate this, at least for the first part of the message. And just like worry, bitterness is a cheat. It steals and takes away from the life and freedom that Jesus Christ offers us. So just like worry, bitterness ain't worth it. And we're going to open up the word of God and hear what God's word has to say to this. So this morning, we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 4. So I want to invite you to turn in your Bible to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 26. So Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. In your anger, do not sin. It is possible to be angry and not sin. There is a righteous kind of anger. But that is not the point that Paul is trying to make here. 
Paul's warning God's people about the danger of anger. And if anger goes unresolved, if you let the sun go down while you're still angry, watch out. Watch out because you are playing with fire. Unresolved anger will lead us to dangerous and destructive places. Let's look at verse 31. I just want to focus on the first phrase in this verse for now. Ephesians 4, 31. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all bitterness. Bitterness is animosity and resentment that can be visible or hidden. And the word that's used in the original language was used literally to describe plants that produce poisonous fruit. And that's helpful to know because bitterness is like poison for our souls. There's a toxic power that unresolved anger and bitterness will eventually bring forth in a person's life. And that's why Paul is saying, get rid of all bitterness. Do not let it go undealt with. But why do we let bitterness reign and linger in our lives? Uh, Frederick Buchner once wrote this about unresolved anger. I think this is helpful for us. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontations still to come, to savor the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. But listen to this. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. There, there's a false power in anger that we think we are able to hold over someone else. But in the end, anger and bitterness will only eat away at your own soul. It will only destroy you from within. It will only bring about self-destruction. You know, I think if I would have heard a message like this many years ago, I would have brushed this aside. I would have said, I don't have an issue with anger or bitterness. This message isn't for me. But over the years, I've realized in some of the ways that God has wired me to be, that anger and bitterness can be a real struggle for me. And it's very hidden in my life. It's an internal battle for me. But when I felt slighted or disappointed in a relationship, there has been a genuine struggle in my life to go to these places of resentment and bitterness. So I want to caution you this morning. Don't be so quick to say this isn't an issue for you. The longer you live, the more opportunity you have had to be wounded and hurt by other people. And I know some of you have experienced significant hurt and pain from those closest to you. Those who are supposed to protect you. Those who are supposed to advocate for you, and instead they harmed you, whether it was a parent, a spouse, a family member, or a good friend. And others can recall moments where someone who was an acquaintance or even a stranger hurt you in a very significant way. And when we're wounded, there is frustration and sadness and anger that these wounds can stir up in us. And I hope you know, know me well enough by now. I don't want to dismiss or minimize pain or hurt ever. So I'm not minimizing the pain you have experienced. But we need to pay attention to the bitterness that can enslave us in these wounds. So we're going to talk next about finding freedom from bitterness. But let's go back to verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. 
This verse is telling us unresolved anger will give the devil a foothold in your life. That bitterness can be a stronghold where you become enslaved. You're not living in the freedom that God wants for you. The image that came to my mind this week as I was reflecting on bitterness is landmines. A landmine is an explosive device that's buried into the ground. So it isn't visible, but it can go off any time that the mine area is stepped upon. So imagine with me a large field. And this field symbolizes your relationships. And there's spots in this field that have flowers and vibrant plants. And this symbolizes relationships in your life that are healthy, that are strong, that are built on love and care. But there are other spots on the field that are just dead spots. They symbolize unhealthy relationships that aren't growing. And buried beneath some of these dead spots are landmines. And these landmines symbolize unresolved anger and bitterness in a relationship. And sometimes we don't even know that they're there because they're hidden. They're buried deep within the relationship. Some of us have bitterness bombs that are buried in our relationship, and there's no telling when that bomb is going to explode and do significant damage. So what do we do? I want to get really practical here. We need to identify the bitterness bombs in our lives. I believe we need to invite the Holy Spirit to help us take inventory of our relationships and to ask him to point out where there might be strongholds of bitterness, where there might be hidden, undealt with anger towards someone in your life. So this week, I want to encourage you to do an exercise. Sometime this week, set aside maybe 30 minutes for this exercise. Take out a sheet of paper or take out your computer. And ask the Holy Spirit to guide you during this time. And you just start writing down names of people in your life history. List as many names as you can. Go back to the beginning with your parents, your siblings, and you just write down names of people. And as you're writing down a name, if you sense a pause in your heart, there's something in that relationship that needs to be dealt with, highlight it in some way. And after you're done writing down as many names as you can, go back over the list. Ask the Holy Spirit to point out any relationships that might have strongholds of bitterness. Or maybe for you, you just start with people that you already know you have bitterness towards. Even as you're hearing this message right now, there are names coming to mind. And you just write those names on the sheet of paper. So the first step is identifying those relationships with potential strongholds. And next, we're going to ask God to unmind the bitterness in these relationships, to bring freedom, and to break the strongholds. Ephesians 4, let's look at verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. The opposite of bitterness is kindness. Be kind and compassionate to one another. I believe what is next is the key to breaking the stronghold of bitterness. And what does the word say? Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is the path to freedom. Forgiveness is the way to break the chains of bitterness. And for some of you, the wounds are so deep, so painful, and it's so hard to forgive. And yet, I believe God will help you. I believe the Holy Spirit will empower you. And so as you look at those names on the paper, it's probably best just to focus on one relationship at a time. 
So you identify one person that you need to forgive. And there is a lingering bitterness towards. And you spend time praying. And you ask God to break the stronghold of bitterness. You ask God to lead you to forgive them. Something like, God, this person really hurt me. I am angry. I am wounded. And I am bitter towards them. But God, I know you are asking me to forgive them. And even though it's hard to do so, I want to obey you. I want to do what you ask me to do. So God, help me to forgive them. Lead me right now to a place of forgiveness for them. Break the bitterness. Bring freedom. And you keep praying for that person. You keep praying for your relationship. Jesus calls us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So you're praying for this person. You're praying that God would bless them now. You're praying that God would pour out his favor upon them. You're praying that God would show this person how much he loves them. And through prayer, you turn bitterness into blessing. Church, I know this is heavy stuff. I know this isn't easy. But we need to address the unresolved anger and the bitterness that gets buried in our lives. God will help us unmine the bitterness. He wants us to live in freedom. Bitterness ain't worth it. It's poison. We need to take it seriously. Like many of you, my, my heart has been so burdened this last week over everything that is happening in our nation. And we are seeing the effects of unresolved issues of hostility, injustice, and bitterness. Church, racism is still an issue in our world. It is dividing and breaking our nation right now. In the next part of the message, I want to share what God has been teaching me, how I'm trying to learn through everything that's going on. I want to share some scriptures that God is using in my own life. And I want to encourage you right now to not be defensive, to be open to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. What is happening in our country is not primarily a political issue. It is primarily a spiritual issue. And there are so many layers to this. There's no way I can address everything, but I want to at least get us started this morning. I started reading a book this week to help me learn and grow amidst all this. And the book is called Beyond Colorblind. It's written by a Christian author, Sarah Shin, and it's been a fantastic read so far. It's biblically focused and gospel-centered. And one of the things I'm learning, and I think it's important for us who are in the majority culture to understand, those of us who are white, some of us might claim to be colorblind, meaning we don't see race in another person. I know the intent behind this is to tell someone that you value them for who they are. But to say you are color, colorblind is not helpful. And it can be even harmful to tell a minority person. What this is doing is telling them that you don't even see them at all. Because ethnicity is part of their identity. It's part of who God made them to be. So church, we need to move beyond being colorblind and instead embrace people's ethnicities and not ignore it. That's the first thing. The second thing, as I was reading the book, 
the author kept using a phrase that just gripped my heart this week. And it's rooted all the way back in Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The word says, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Every human being has been made by the Most High God in the image of God. And the Latin phrase for the image of God is imago Dei. And that is the phrase that has been seared on my heart this week. That is the phrase that has brought me to tears many times this week. Imago Dei. Every person that you will ever set eyes on, every person that you will ever have a conversation or interaction with, every person in our church, every person in our world, every person has been made in the Imago Dei. Every person, no matter what their ethnic identity their skin color, their background is a reflection of the image of God. And there is beauty in ethnicity because ethnicity reflects the beauty of God. So church, as we value and honor people's ethnic identity, the Imago Dei in them, we honor and we worship God as creator, Imago Dei. Let's go back to Ephesians 4, 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Get rid of all that junk, rage, Anger, malice against another human being. Get rid of all racism, discrimination, hostility towards a person of another ethnicity. Racism is a violation of the Imago Dei. It's a violation against our God as creator. There, there's no way you can biblically argue and tell me that racism is not a sin. It's an offense against God. And the value and dignity and worth that he gives every person because of the image of God in them. And right now, right now, there is so much unresolved anger and deep-seated bitterness in our nation. But instead of pointing the finger at someone else, instead of trying to justify, explain away, or rationalize anything, it needs to start by looking in the mirror. There's a song sung by two Christian artists. Toby, Toby Mack, who's a white Christian, his friend Aaron Cole, who is a black Christian. And to get together in this song, they talk about the brokenness and racism in our country. And here are the lyrics of a part of the song. It's titled, It Starts With Me. With a heavy road in front of us, in a system that has lost our trust, can we ever find the strength to rise from ashes? And looking at the heart of it, the, the healing nearly can't begin. 
without confession and forgiveness and compassion. And Toby Mac, who's white, sings this part. I was born with two dirty hands. Something my daddy didn't understand. Something his daddy didn't understand. So it starts with me. Then Aaron Cole, who is black, sings this part. I was raised with distrust in my heart. Mama told me we're in worlds apart. Her mama told her, don't even bother. So it starts with me. It starts with me. It starts with me being honest about my attitudes and my prejudices. It starts with me being humble and repentant before God and how I have violated the Imago Dei in someone else. It starts with me who's turned a blind eye to the systematic injustice and oppression against minorities. It starts with me having conversations with people of different ethnicities, asking them about their cultural identity, asking them about the challenges that they face being a minority, listening to their pain, having compassion and empathy, not sweeping their pain under the rug, embracing the Imago Dei in them, the beauty of who God has made them to be, asking them questions like, what do you love about your ethnicity? What do you struggle with, with your ethnicity? How have you been discriminated against? Church, it needs to start with us having honest conversations, building relationships, listening and learning. This is how change will begin. And yet, ultimately, our hope for real change isn't going to come from our government. It isn't going to come from new laws being passed. Because the issue of racism is a heart issue. And there's only one who can change the human heart. Only one. Jesus Christ. Our hope for reconciliation and healing come through Jesus and the reconciling power of the cross. And back in Jesus' time, there was all sorts of racism too. Romans oppressing Jews. Hostility between Jews and Gentiles. Jews and Samaritans. And Ephesians 2 speaks about what Jesus did through the cross to bring reconciliation to the Jews and the Gentiles. Ephesians 2, 11 through 17. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now in Jesus Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and then one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, peace to those who were near. Two groups, Jews and Gentiles, hostility and enmity. And these two divided people groups were made into one people because Christ destroyed the barrier, the wall of hostility. God brought peace 
and healing, creating a new family. Church, the hope for reconciliation starts with the cross of Jesus Christ. And to know because of Christ, there is healing and unity possible for people of different ethnic backgrounds. To know because of Christ, I have brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world from different people groups. Because of Jesus, those who believe in Christ, we are all part of one family. Because of what Jesus has done, heaven is going to be filled with people from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, as Revelation 7 tells us. And we will stand together as one people before the throne and before the Lamb of God. And we will cry out together, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Christ is the hope for reconciliation. Jesus has done it in the past. Jesus can do it again now. Many of you are aware of this, but in Rwanda, 1994, there was intense racial hostility between two people groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. And over the span of 100 days, the Hutus led a genocide, and they killed 800,000 Tutsis. 800,000 people slaughtered because of the people group they were a part of. No words can capture the horror of that and what was done. In time, in the midst of this tragic loss of life, the tremendous pain and hostility, a group of pastors and community leaders came together, trying to lead the people out of the mess they were in. And God, God was at work in a powerful way. There was much confession, repentance, and healing that took place through conversations. And reconciliation meetings filled with tears. People started to forgive one another. And one of the leaders said this about the reconciliation. Only at the cross. Only at the cross can victim and perpetrator die to themselves and rise as one new people. Only at the cross. Because when we come to the cross of Jesus Christ, humility and confession and repentance is needed. We can't stand before the cross and beat our chest thinking we are okay. We die to ourselves and our pride. And we acknowledge and confess our sins at the cross. And at the cross, we are united. And we are bound together. No matter our skin color. No matter our ethnicity. The cross has made us a new people. And church, my hope is that our church would continue to grow to be a multicultural, intergenerational family. But let us not be naive to the obstacles and the challenges with this. This is going to be an ongoing process. And God is going to have to lead us and continue to guide us. And we need to start with humility and honesty. We can't ignore the reality of racism. We can't ignore the oppression and the injustice. We need to repent for how we have contributed. We need to lament and weep and listen and learn. Church, we need to move beyond being colorblind. And we need to value other people's ethnic identities. Church, we need to honor God 
by valuing the Imago Dei, the Imago Dei in every single human being. We need to have honest and sincere ongoing conversations, building relationships across ethnic lines and listening and understanding and walking together. And church, we need to look to the cross of Jesus Christ as our hope for reconciliation and healing. As a practical next step, I want to encourage you this week, have a conversation with someone from a diff different ethnic background and be a learner. Be a listener. Provide a safe place for them to share honestly. Honor the Imago Dei in them. Ask them questions about their life history and what they have faced because of their ethnicity. And don't just make it a one-time conversation. Checking a box because I'm telling you to do this. Build a relationship with them. Grow together. Walk together. Church, just like bitterness, racism ain't worth it and it ain't right. It's offensive to our God. It is poison to our world right now. And we need to pray. We need to ask God to break the strongholds, to bring freedom and healing. And it starts with you and I. It starts with us who bow our knees and bow our hearts and have given our lives to Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace and the Lord of all. So let, let's pray together now because we need to pray about all this. Father, may we not push aside what you are trying to do right now in us. I pray that you would meet every single person right now. I pray, pray first for the Holy Spirit to point out relationships where bitterness might be buried. Your word says, get rid of all bitterness. And so, God, we need your help to identify those landmines, those bitterness bombs in our relationship. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us identify where strongholds have taken root in our lives. And we're going to ask God, through the authority and the power of Jesus Christ, that you would break the strongholds of bitterness. Break the strongholds of unresolved anger. God, you have forgiven us of all our sins. And you've called us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. So lead us to places of forgiveness. Bring freedom in our lives. And God, we acknowledge that racism still exists in our world. And it breaks your heart. And God, we want to be a people that are broken over the things that break your heart. Help us to move beyond being colorblind. Help us to see the beauty in all ethnicities because they reflect the Imago Dei, the image of God in people. Help us to honor the Imago Dei in people. And God, I pray right now for pastors and churches all around the world this Sunday. I pray that it would start in the church. Humility and lament and weeping and repentance. May healing start in the church. 
and may justice start in the church through your people acting justly, doing what is right, speaking on behalf of the oppressed. And God, our hope is completely in you in the power of Jesus Christ and what you have done on the cross. So bring the healing and the peace that is possible only in Christ. And I pray this would be just another step on the journey for us as a church. I pray that you would lead us forward. What's next for us as a church? So God, we humble ourselves before you. We thank you for your word that speaks into our current reality. And we want to honor you. And we want to love you and love our neighbors. So help us, God. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, let's uh, worship God, continue to praise him through song. I'm actually going to flip the two songs that um, we're going to start with uh, Ancient of Days, which is a brand new song. And I want to teach you the chorus first. Oh, his love is sure and 
Church is wonderful worshiping with you.
sometimes it's hard for me to know what to say at the end. Uh, I just, I want to acknowledge that that was a heavy sermon. Uh, but again, I want to just encourage you, don't dismiss what God's trying to do in you. And this just can't be a one-time message. We need to continue to journey together and to do it in relationships and in conversations. Uh, every night, um, Yvonne prays Micah 6-8 over our kids. And I'm so grateful for just uh, her praying this verse over them. Um, and many of you know this verse. He has shown you, all you people, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So church, this week, may we walk humbly with our great God, and may we act justly and love mercy for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen.